Welcome to our highly organized um, and very serious end of year podcast. Happy uh, Christmas. <laughs> yeah, Merry all the Christmases. Um, where we're going to look at some of the things that we've learned this year and some of the favorite books we've read, um, some of the things we've learned and some of the things that we would like to do um, for the year ahead or for next year. Um, so as uh, our regular podcast host is Bren, um, and he's way better at this than any of us, I thought I'd hand over to Bren and you can, you can uh, be our host with the most. Okay, thanks Chris. So happy Christmas to everyone. Um, so our kind of structure is we're going to talk about three books three-ish books that we have really liked across the year, maybe not released this year, but ones that we enjoyed this year, and three things that we've learned this year. And I think because Jake is the biggest bookworm among us and learns more than any of us all put together, probably, let's start <laughs> with Jake. So, Jake, what were your book highlights this year? Uh, so it's always so tough to go first, so thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, very difficult to, to choose three from, from all the books um, I've read this year. I think my, my first one would, would probably be a book called Richer, Wiser, Happier, How the World's Greatest Investors Win in Markets and Life by William Green. Um, and I enjoyed it because I'd just been trying to educate myself a bit more about investing uh, this year and I'd read quite a few books on investing and this was the first book I thought that was actually really really good um, and I think it was because he gave such a good uh, overview of the different ways of approaching investors um, or in investing um, from all these kind of incredible investing minds so obviously there's more ways to do um investing than than just one one approach um and i i i love that book because it, it looked at all the the greatest investors um and kind of broke down how they uh, operated um and as the book's title suggests there was a lot more in there than just investing a lot of the rules and uh, principles applied to to life and is that a recently released one or it's like a classic text that has I, principles that you can apply forever? I feel like it had, it was released this year. I'll have to double check that. Um, okay. I'm, but I'm pretty sure it was out of, out of all the three I chose. I think that was the one that the only one that was released this year, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty confident it was released this year, but yeah, it's, if you're going to read a book on investing, um, I mean, I'm, I must've read 20 odd or something this year. That was, that was the standout one for me. Okay, so the killer question, does it mention crypto then? Oh, good question. <laughs> I, I can't remember if it actually mentions crypto specifically or not. Um, that's a, a very good question. I can't remember the answer. I don't, if it does mention crypto, it, it doesn't go into much detail. Um, I mean, if you mention crypto in an investing book, it's going to be out of date the minute you publish it anyway. So what's that, the point? That's true. Yeah, <laughs> pretty, pretty fast moving world. Um, yeah, for sure. Okay. But yeah, that, that was my my first what, one. What's everyone? Has, has anyone on the call got cryptocurrency, or what's your favorite cryptocurrency? Ooh, um, uh, the only cryptocurrency I have is 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 Bitcoin and Ethereum. He bought it in two thousand and five, so he's uh, <laughs> sitting pretty. That's why I've got such a big smile on my face. Really? Yeah, Jake, Jake and I, when we first made that fintech course um, with Barclays, uh, when we were designing that course, we learned all the, we had to learn all about cryptocurrency and both of us were like, oh, we should, we should probably invest in Bitcoin. And at the time it was about like a hundred dollars or something. And we were like, oh, God, it's really expensive, man. Like, and we're just starting the company. So neither of us had any money. Um, yeah, every cent we had went into 42 courses. So we were like, I don't know, man, we just can't afford to do it. Like, and, and we were having a chat about it the other day. We're like, oh God, like if I only we had known. <laughs> so we kind of, I mean, and the sad thing is we kind of knew that anyway, like we, we both were, were kind of confident it was going to do well. We just didn't have the capital at the time, which I think is, yeah, but I don't know. I wouldn't change it. It's still a bargain now at $50,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. De de yeah, depending on who you listen to. Yeah, there's still, it's still, potentially going to the moon um i mean I, I think i watched one video the other day where the guy was saying oh, it's going to be bitcoin's going to be 12 million dollars in the next you know three years or something stupid so yeah there's still there's still early is the yeah. message i think 
as, as a company, we've invested a tiny bit into Bitcoin and a tiny bit into Ethereum, but we're not Elon Musk levels. I think, I think the one that, though, that seems interesting at the moment seems to be Solana, which is kind of like Ethereum in that it's a smart contract based one, but it seems to be much easier for developers to work with and much faster. Um, so that's interesting. Yeah, and I think it's I think that's only about a hundred, hundred and forty pounds at the moment. So maybe that's where all your pounds fourteen pence at the moment. It's it's one of those yeah. when we're recording this. It's one of those moments where it's by the dip. By the time you watch this, it's probably sky high again or or gone. Down. I read today. I read I read today. It's one hundred and forty eight dollars because Melania Trump is selling images of herself for really? one soul for one hundred and forty eight dollars. You can buy them as a Christmas gift today. Oh, wow. Interesting Christmas. There, there you go. If anyone's <laughs> lost for ideas for Christmas gifts, uh, there yeah. you go. We'll have to get this podcast edited very quickly so people can get their Melania Trump Solana <laughs> image. <laughs> okay. I think the way this is going, we shouldn't stick on Jake, but we should go around the table because we're going to run out of time. What do you think? Cool. Definitely. So, so I, Irene, what's your top book of the year? Oh, so for me, it's it's always like I love to read nonfiction and and fiction. So I really do love to have like a combination. And I think probably if I was to go fiction, I would say it would have to be this book that's called Ten Minutes and Thirty Eight Seconds in the Strange World. It's beautiful. It's set in Istanbul, and it was the first book that made me cry in a very long time. So I think wow. that it was absolutely beautiful. So I highly recommend that. And then I would say for nonfiction, I would have to say I reread um, Malcolm Gladwell's Blink book this year. And I just thought it was amazing. I read it years and years ago. And then, you know, I kind of like forgot all about it. And then when I was reading it again this year, I was like, this is brilliant. So it's definitely one of those all time classics that I'll probably return to in the next five years. I'll probably read it again. It's funny how that happens like when you reread books and then. You kind of fall in love and you again. Pick up different things, and yeah. yeah, so very interesting. It's so I strange like because I literally reread it and finished it two two nights ago. That's so oh, really? Yeah, really? Yeah. Wow! But just yeah. going back to ten minutes, thirty eight seconds, and the rest of the title. Is it yeah. like um? So it made you cry. Is it like sci fi? <laughs> it, no, it's, it's a romance, it's, right? No, so I wouldn't say it's romance either. I would say it's about um, friendship and how these people in Istanbul, they sort of like outcasts and how they sort of all meet each other and, and form this like beautiful kind of friendship that's the same as um, family because none of them really have family. And basically, I don't want to give anything away, but I don't think I'm giving anything away, but the main character actually dies. And they say that you have... Oh, you're <laughs> no, no, no. I think that's like the whole point of it. So it's basically the brain activity that's left in a person after they die. They say it's between eight minutes and 10 minutes and 38 seconds. So it's all the things oh. that she remembers throughout her life. Ah. It's beautiful. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. wow. Okay. Very interesting. Smells, how they trigger like different memories. And is that yeah. really a thing? Like when you die, there's about eight minutes of Apparently. brain activity left. Apparently. Yeah, supp supposedly. I don't. Like, yeah, so yeah, you wonder how how do they figure that out? Yeah, I would I like to find out. ECG <laughs> on the brain. So, yeah, someone yeah. someone died in an MRI scanner or something, and probably yeah, yeah, or yeah, with an ECG or something. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, we'll we'll put all these books. Uh, we'll put links to them in the description as well, so people don't have to write massive notes as we're going through. Okay, so let's let's move on to the next one. Elisa, what is your top pick? Uh, a bit like Irene, I read fiction and nonfiction. And in the pandemic, I wanted two things, either to be educated or entertained. This was not the year for me to start Dostoevsky. Uh, what I really loved this year was The Spy and the Traitor by Ben McIntyre. If any of you have read that, it is amazing. It is a history book that reads like a thriller. It tells these parallel stories of a Soviet spy who was working for the British and a CIA agent who defected to the Soviets. And they, effectively, the Soviet spy gets found out and he has to escape. And it is the most amazing story of how he gets out and all the things he prevented. So highly, highly recommend that one. And another one I did this year, The Tyranny of Merit by Michael Sandel. 
I kind of love everything he does. He is just one of those people that's incredibly eloquent. And I think actually with this year as well, the fact that you're talking about uh, the elites in society thinking they're there as a product of meritocracy, I think it has a remarkable resonance and he, he makes a lot of valid points about working for the common good, uh, which I find quite reassuring because so many people have come out, whatever cause it is, this year. Yeah. So yeah, those are, those are a couple of my favorites, but like Jake said, it's so hard to choose, just narrowing this down for this one. It is, yeah. Ben McIntyre's fantastic, right? I'm very, very jealous of his talents. And he, I think he wrote that, um, I mean, he's written quite a few books, hasn't he? But he, he wrote the one that you've got a connection to, Bren, with the name yeah. of your, your dogs. Oh. Well, yeah, so he, I think it might have been his first one, Operation Mincemeat, um, which is a true story from the Second World War. But I, I read it because um, my dad uh, was in a film jumping out of an airplane in, from a parachute. And it was in the opening credits of the film, The Man Who Never Was, which is the oh, story right. of Operation Mincemeat. There's a new and film in that coming book, out. There is a new film coming out of it, yeah the remake yeah. um so my dad's looking for a starring role again obviously yeah but um <laughs> in that book one of the one of the characters is a, a, a real life person called um sir bentley purchase and when i read that i thought that's just such an awesome name so Incredible. i named my dog sir yeah and i think he purchase. was like the, the coroner in king's cross wasn't he yeah and he was but the, the funny one that really the body the funny thing is when bentley when bentley was a puppy i used to make videos and put them on youtube and called it you know sir bentley purchase and his grandson contacted me and said why did you call your dog sir bentley purchase that's my granddad oh wow and i told him the story and he said that's amazing he said because the dog actually looks like exactly like the dog we had when we were a kid oh wow, oh, wow. we were kids incredible yeah, yeah i mean it's the most in Incredible story. I don't know if you've you've heard come across it, Eliza, but if you enjoyed um that the other book, then you'll absolutely love Operation Mince Me. It's it's I mean, it's one of the most mind-blowing stories, I think, of World War II in terms of the the level of planning and um luck and you know the role of luck and chance that played uh played played its part. Yeah, it's incredible. That's definitely up my street. I'm reading that soon. And Agent Sonia as well is also absolutely amazing. And you, can, you just can't believe these things happen in real life. Yeah, I mean, particularly that Operation Mincemeat. I mean, it's just because it's obviously pre, you know, tech, a lot of the technology we have today, like coordinating and making something that like that work, you know, required obviously just insane amounts of, of, of planning. And um, mm. yeah, it's, it's just incredible that it even happened. Talking about uh, amazing bits of planning, Chris, have you completed your list? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not lastminute.com. Uh, yeah, I, it was really hard to choose as well. I, I mean, I think I, I read a lot and I, I, again, probably mostly, mostly uh, non-fiction, non but I do read a, a few fiction things. I think they're my three favourite of this year. I've got five listed down here, so I'm trying to, still trying to figure out what my three favourite were. But I think if you put a gun to my head, it would probably be it would probably be four of them. <laughs> How can I take this down to three? Um, I really, really, really liked the No Rules Rules. I, I think it's an oldish book. I just never got round to reading it until this year, which was the one from Reed Hastings, the chap who started Netflix, and Erin Mayer, um, who's brilliant at kind of talking about the differences in culture and where you are in the world and how that relates to how you work and your work processes um, and it was it's just a really interesting book I think and I think there's lots of lessons that you can take out of that that are very practical as well for if you're sort of running a team whether it's big or small um, there's some incredible stuff in there and it's, it tells lots of fun stories and it's she gives you a really interesting overview of how Netflix has grown and how it works. Um, Cause it, it seems 
I could, it, it, I, I mean, I don't work at Netflix. I know some people who work at Netflix, but it seems like basically you've got to be really, really good at your job and it's kind of brutal in a way. But at the same time, if you are good at your job, you're, a, you're given a lot of freedom to, to kind of make decisions yourself, which I think is what we all want, right? Like everyone kind of wants autonomy in their, in their world. What is it? Autonomy, mastery, purpose. I think they do a good job at putting their purpose across and I think they they give people a lot of autonomy so yeah it seems to seems to work and and they seem to try and hire people who are already masters um uh -huh. so yeah that that was a great one and then um the other one which I it, it's done by a guy who actually did my favorite one of my four well, is it my favorite Ken Robinson is probably my favorite, but um, one of my favorite ever talks is, a, is from a guy called Aaron Dignan. And um, earlier in the year, we launched a creative leadership course. And so when we were doing the research for that, one of the books that I read was Brave New Work um, by Aaron Dignan. And it's, um, it just was full of so many amazing things. Um, and I think there's a couple of things in the book as well that he had found in his research that we ended up using in the course as well. So there's, there's one that one great thing, which I thought was really valuable was um, that user manual of me thing. Um, I think I was banging on a, about a lot at the beginning of the year. So what it is, is the brief explanation would be normally um, when you work with other people, you don't necessarily know how they like to work. You, you, you normally learn by trial and error, which is kind of stupid in a way, if you think about it, because there's no need for us to do that. If you just ask someone, you know, how do you like getting feedback? Um, you know, what, mm -hmm. what, what makes you really happy? What really annoys you? Um, mm. So this user manual is ba basically a document, really easy, plain English that you can fill out as an individual, and then you can share with your team. And it tells you the kind of pet peeves and all the things that people really like so that when you want to, you know, say if you're in a massive organization, I would imagine this is very, very helpful in a large organization. In a small company like us, it's probably quite easy because if you know, I want to ask Elisa something, I'll just say, hey, Elisa, and then we can have a chat about it. But if you're in a large organization, you've got to get, you know, if Jake was CEO of, I don't know, like whatever, a massive company, Google, um, and I didn't know Jake, but I wanted to ask him for something, it would be amazingly helpful if I could look up a you know, his user profile or his, that he's filled out. And then I would know how to interact with Jake. You know, does he want a long email or a short email? Does he want, you know, what's going to be my best way of working with him? You'll be able to find that on the blockchain ledger for each individual. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Uh, that but um, yeah, I thought that was really helpful. And then the third one I'm going to go for, <laughs> my, other, my other two were Nudge, which I read again, brilliant. I just, I loved it more the second time. Um, I thought that was like what you were saying, Irene. Um, Bomber Mafia, total nonfiction. Loved it. It's the most favorite audio book I've ever read or listened to. Very good as an audio book. Don't buy the book. Um, and then Humankind was my, fav my other favorite book. So the Humankind one was, if you like, Humankind is Rutger Bren Bren Brengen? Brennan? R R Rutger Bregman. Sorry, so bad at pronouncing names. I think um, he's Dutch. Yeah, yeah, Dutch chap, and he, yeah, he he became famous, I think, because he stood up at Davos and said, "You know, you're all kind of hypocrites coming here, saying that you know the world is terrible when you fly in your private jets, and a lot of the problems in the world would be solved if if all of you who are here actually just paid taxes." Um, <laughs> Uh, so uh, he got nice. a standing ovation for that, I think. But his book is nothing really about that. It's it's kind of like um, it reminded me a bit of *Sapiens* in a way, um, in that there's lots of really great stories, um, and it's just sort of talking about how I guess in the world we often think that things are always really bad and that people's behaviour is really bad, um, probably because it's in the news's best interest to say that everything is terrible because that gets our attention much more than happy things. Um, but as someone has <laughs> literally restarted this company to make learning more enjoyable, so we're all about happy. Um, reading that Humankind book filled me with warm, happy stories because it was it's basically showing all these examples of how things are actually 
really nice and and good <laughs> but the stories are brilliant and the, the message is lovely in it anyway i've done a terrible job of reviewing that book but please forgive me no 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 so so it was it was it a bit like um factfulness then you know that hans rosling one yes but yeah so definitely definitely yeah factfulness is uh, i love that book so much but not as an audio book that's terrible as an audio book factfulness because it keeps saying in the downloadable pdf yeah yes. exactly. yeah i and noticed that got, there's so many charts and data that it must be very yeah. hard to explain yeah. but at the end it's really nice because they do have it's read by his daughter or his son or something i think and then at the end that you you've got his kids saying you know what happened because he died just after the book was finished so he, he did get to yeah, see sad. what it was like and I, I was yeah i was in tears at the end of that book um listening to his kids talk about a dad um what a remarkable yeah thing. it was it was because he i mean i think he passed away a similar time to sir ken robinson or yeah so both last like, year i think yeah i think both last year which was really sad because yeah both like hugely influential people um, yeah yeah, for us, hugely influential as well. I, don't, I mean, I, I don't know whether I would have got into education stuff if, if I hadn't have listened to that Ken Robinson talk in whatever, 2014 or... Um, whatever. Yeah. Um, hugely influential. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Okay. So going from a little bit of sadness to happiness, <laughs> my top pick, my top pick of the year. Yeah, so my favourite book of the year is actually an audio book and it's um, called Absolute Pandemonium. And it's by someone who's a very famous person in the UK, but maybe not outside. It's by Brian Blessed, um, who is had an incredible life. He is the son of a miner in a northern mining village, almost living in poverty. And he's just done everything in his life. He's uh, been on every stage around the world. There's been so many amazing films and he's been up Everest and He's an explorer and he has a very larger than life personality and he narrates the book and it's like hugely enjoyable. It's a riot, in fact. I, I read, um, read it too. It's so, or listened to it too. And it's absolutely incredible. Brilliant. Yeah. I mean, Five every hours. single yeah. sentence is just filled with like, what? <laughs> what, what was the most surprising thing that you discovered he'd done? Um, well, <laughs> well, he starts the book and this is tells you like the, the the vibe of the book as well he starts the book with a story about him <laughs> taking a poo on everest <laughs> oh wow okay but it's incredibly funny it sounds vulgar but it's incredibly funny the way he describes it. <laughs> so yeah i mean it's just like that the whole way through it's just like your jaws are aching from smiling and laughing and stuff it's, just... it's just so funny because he's met so many other famous people yeah. worked with so many other people famous people so he, he just tells you all these incredible stories about other people and then the, the favorite thing <clears throat> i think from that book which i think i was telling you jake the other day was he he said that there was a big difference between actors and musicians he said yeah. that actors go crazy, but never normally fall crazy because they're surrounded by, you know, normal people at a film set who, you know, lead regular lives. Whilst musicians are kind of totally surrounded and in their own little bubble. So they're never really around normal people. They, they don't need to do anything with the public too much, whilst actors generally do. Um, and so that's why he said that musicians are normally batshit crazy or can be batshit crazy. Um, yeah, always... maybe it helps, to un helps us to understand Kanye West a bit more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and because you, you were in it, you're all in, we're all influenced by the people that we spend the most amount of time with. So if we're incredibly crazy and we spend all our time around other crazy people and we, we shield ourselves off from from the public, which is kind of what a lot of them do, then no wonder they they seem to be slightly eccentric um, often. But, uh, yeah, it's such a brilliant book. I love that one too. Great, great choice. Um, and my other books, so I, I, I have two dogs and I and I run a lot, so I consume a lot of audio books. So it's more audio books than, um, than reading books. But uh, 
So a great book for running. If anyone's a runner out there, 26.2 Miles to Happiness by Paul Tomkinson. He's a, he used to be a comedian in, in the 90s and he has got a real way with words, just fantastically constructed uh, descriptive sentences. Really brilliant. And, and describing the, the, the journey that you go through when you're training and actually doing a marathon. It's really great. From a work perspective, how not to plan it's really for marketing and advertising people by Les Minette and Sarah Carter. It's so accessible the way the book is set out. It's like little chapters and you get a quote and you get the, the thinking of Les Minette and Sarah Carter. Then you get a checklist of what you should be doing about this particular topic and a case study. And it's just very dip inable and outable. And it's like covers everything you, you shouldn't need to know about uh, strategy and planning in, in the marketing field. Superb book. And from doing the podcast, actually, which has been a real joy over the year, um, Simon Lancaster, uh, well, I had to read like three or four books almost every time for each, each guest, but Simon Lancaster's books really uh, stood out to me because they are about um, leadership and the words that you use and Winning Minds, Secrets of the Language of Leadership is a fantastic book, great audio book read by Glenn McCready, fantastic voice. And and this one I actually read the next one, How Words Kill, You Are Not Human, which is all about how metaphors are used by mainly politicians. But um, it's, uh, it's really insightful. And if you are interested in humans or you're interested in the humans that are leading you, the politicians, you should read that book because it shows how words can be extremely manipulative. Very important book, I think. And Invisible to, to be Invaluable, um, Unleashing the Power of uh, Midlife Women from uh, Jane Evans and Carol Russell. We had those on, we had uh, Jane and Carol on the podcast. Really blew my mind about the history of, um, of, uh, of black women in America and England. I mean, it's not entirely about that, but that's a part of the initial part of the book. And really extraordinary stuff and then when if you listen to the podcast with carol and, and jane they are absolutely uh a hoot and and the audiobook of that is they just have so much fun doing it as well so that so that was a stand-up book for me as well 